Greetings. My name is Jake, and I'm one of the senior geoscientists here at Elise. This video will cover the General PaleoScan Overview 2023. Let's get started. So today's video will cover the general overview of the PaleoSan software. PaleoScan is a fully integrated 2D, 3D visualization environment, allowing you to quickly visualize and use all of your geologic data, seismic, horizons, faults, wells. We've got some really great tools to allow you to interact between 2D and 3D viewers. We're going to show you in this video all of the ways to manipulate your seismic, your wells, your horizons by way of displaying real-time attributes using image blending capabilities. And we're going to put it all together in a 3D view uh, that's going to be very stunning and allow you to really focus on your area of interest. Let's start today by just a general overview of the software, and then we'll jump around and we'll cover all of the other topics as we move forward. Okay, let's start by opening up a seismic line. We do this by double clicking on the seismic volume in my project browser. You can also right click and select the very first option, open. I'll double click on my title bar to expand the view across the entire workspace. And let's talk about some of the ways we can manipulate this view. Using my mouse, if I roll my scroll wheel, you'll see I can advance through my inlines forward and backward. Another way I can do this is by grabbing the tab in my volume manager and dragging it left and right. You can see the corresponding inline here. To translate the view, push down on your scroll wheel, which is your mouse button three, to grab the view and move it around. Finally, to zoom in and out, push the, uh, hold down your secondary mouse button, push the mouse away from you to zoom, pull the mouse towards you to zoom out. So hold down your secondary mouse button and push forward to zoom. Hold down your secondary mouse button and drag that image, that mouse back towards you to zoom out. To change the color bar is very simple. Just below your volume manager, you have the color bar pane. By selecting a specific color scheme that you prefer, you'll instantly change your seismic volume to uh, display that color bar. To alter that color bar, Place your mouse or your cursor within the gradient window and roll your scroll wheel. This will decrease and increase the contrast from your maximum values. By grabbing the small red dot with your primary mouse button moving left and right, you can heat up or cool down the entire display. Putting your cursor in the coral colored uh, section of your histogram and dragging them um, left and right will terminate your end members. If you've played around with your color bar and you want to go back to the original, click on the Initiate button. Let's open a few more seismic views and set up a really nice display. So I'll double click again on my seismic once to open up a new inline and I'll right click and say Open to open up the third inline window. I can tile these windows very quickly with a Shift T command. A neat Hot key trick is to hold down the Alt key and drag and drop your color bar into your seismic windows. That will automatically apply that color scale or that color bar to your other open windows. To move between a inline and cross line and time slice is very simple. Highlight or click once in the window you wish to change and interact with your volume manager. I'll change one window to an inline and another to a time slice. So I've got an inline, crossline, and time slice view from the same seismic volume. 
And now I want to show you the cross navigation tool. This is one of the more unique and really useful tools within the software. Here it is in the main toolbar. The hot key is the G or gamma key. By turning that on and placing my cursor within any of the windows, holding down my primary mouse button and dragging it, you'll see I'm going to update all of my other windows to exactly that same spot that I'm placing my cursor at in my inline. This works for any window. So if I move to my cross line, you'll see now that my inline and time slice windows will move. And if I go to my time slice window, you'll see I can move both my cross line and my time slice. Using this cross navigation tool, I can quickly navigate to places of interest. For instance, I know there's a nice gas cap here. I can find it either in my time slice volume and then hone in on a more precise location in either my inline or cross line. If this is an area of interest to me, I can save this location by interacting with the location save icon. Let's do that again for some salt that's in this area. There we go. This is a neat salt dome feature. If I want to save that location, I'll do the same thing. And finally, I know there's some pretty cool sh uh, faulting going on here. Let's save that location as well. Now to jump back to any of those locations, I simply double click on the location. It'll bring me directly to that spot and it'll also open up a location browser. I can drag and drop my other saved locations. And by clicking once on any of those will bring me directly to that saved location. Now let's show you a little bit of the way we interact not only with the 2D viewers, but how we use the 2D viewers to set up a 3D viewer. By clicking on the icon in any of the upper left hand corners of the open inline cross line or time slice windows, I can select to display my 2D view in 3D. I will link them together. I'll use a shift T command to tile my windows. And you'll see I have now my time slice displayed in 3D. I can do the same with an inline and a cross line. Now, because I've linked them all together by moving uh, in my cursor in any of the cross line or inlines or time slice, you'll see that it's updating and linking directly to my 3D viewer. The last thing I'd like to show you with regards to the general display is the ability to create a cube in 3D. By right-clicking on my seismic, I'll select new 3D cube. You'll see the software displays the full seismic cube in my 3D window. And just like I did before, I'll assign that color bar to that cube. By selecting any edge, top or bottom, I can manipulate that cube to make it as large or as small as I like. Let's look at the next topic. The next topic we're going to talk about are attributes. PaleoScan has a full array of saved and on the fly attributes that we'll cover. Okay. Let's start by opening two seismic windows. I just double clicked twice on the seismic volume to open two seismic inline volumes. I'll use a shift T to tile those windows in the workspace. In PaleoScan, we have a whole suite of available attributes that you can find in your volume tab. 
the first icon will open up your attribute selection. And you'll notice we have some uh, different icons here in my attribute list. This first group of attributes that has the seismic icon next to it are all attributes that can be applied to seismic volumes. Next are attributes that can be applied to our relative geologic time volume. We'll cover the creation of that in another video. Finally, at the very end are the stacked icons of the RGT and seismic. And of course, these are attributes that you can calculate on either your relative geologic time or RGT volume or the seismic. These would be standalone attributes if you desired, or you can make them virtual attributes, which would be housed under the main parent input. I'd like to focus today more on real time attributes. With my seismic inline selected, I'll come to my properties pane, and you'll notice the first window here says attribute, and currently it's set to none. So I'm just displaying the seismic attribute. If I click once and then again, I'll list all of the attributes that I have available to calculate on the fly from my seismic. I'll pick relative, uh, let's do RMS amplitude first. And you'll see that very quickly the software has updated my first window to display an on the fly RMS amplitude. Now I can scroll just like I did before in and out of my inlines without any lag. You'll notice that that display is being updated. Now because an RMS amplitude is a windowed calculation. You'll notice that for this attribute, I have a window size that I can increase or decrease to alter the appearance of that RMS amplitude display. Now, some attributes will not have a windowed, a windowed parameter. So on my second inline, you'll see I'll go ahead and change this to sweetness, let's say. You'll see sweetness is just a uh, static calculation, so there's no window size to adjust. I can link these two windows together using an alt and then dragging and dropping one window to the next. And you'll see that because I've linked these windows, anything I do in one is going to be reflected in the other. And you'll notice that the on-the-fly attributes are being preserved. Just like we did before, I can choose to display these attributes in a 3D viewer. If I like, I can go ahead and change the inline to a cross line. That way we can see both the RMS and the sweetness in that 3D. Now, because I've linked them, anything I do in the, uh, the main window, my seismic window, is of course reflected in the 3D window. So I've shown you a few real-time attribute capabilities for seismic, but there are also real-time attributes that we apply to our relative geologic time volume. Like I said earlier, we'll cover the creation of this in a later video. But the attributes associated with the RGT volume is going to be a little different than the ones associated with my seismic. But with the RGT volume window selected, I can come to my attributes list and I'll turn on the thinning attribute. The thinning attribute highlights areas where a large number of relative geologic ages are converging. Just like I did with my other two windows, I can display this in 3D. And you can see the movement of all of these windows being displayed here in 3D. All right, let's close those windows. Jump to the next topic. The next topic we're gonna to cover is well correlation. We've put a lot of work into our wells module. It's been greatly improved over the last couple of years. And I'll just show you a few ways to set up a nice display using a seismic inline 3D and my wells. So I'll first start by double clicking on the seismic window to open up a seismic window. 
By default, it opens, in, opens as an inline window. And now I'll show you how we display wells very quickly. I'll go to my well tab in my project browser and I've created a template. So I'll double click on my template. I'll tell the software which wells I want to apply that template to. The software will then open those wells. Replying the template that I had created previously. Now I can zoom in and out just like I do with any of my seismic windows. I can translate the same method by pushing down on my scroll wheel. And I can also very quickly use the cross navigation tool to navigate from between my, my wells uh, display and my seismic. So right now I'm only seeing a deviation survey in my seismic, but if I want, I can drag and drop the, the gamma ray display from my correlation view into my seismic view. And that way I'll be able to see that display in my seismic. Again, wherever I use that cross navigation tool, it'll automatically jump. I can link my well correlation window and my seismic window so that any zoom or translation will be applied to either window. So if I zoom in one window, it'll zoom in the next. If I translate in one window, it'll translate in the next. I can apply markers if I like. So let's click on one marker. And here's a neat little feature. If I right click, you'll notice I have these select similar objects. So the software recognizes that I'm wanting to select my markers. I'll just drag and drop those into my well correlation view. I'll zoom in, you see now I've got my markers displayed. Using the cross navigation tool, I'll zoom in to my markers in my seismic, and you'll notice that the names of those markers are not being displayed, and that's okay. By default, they're turned off, but if I come to my properties pane, I can choose to turn the names of those markers on and off. So it's nice to be able to see where your, where your wells are on a seismic inline. However, one really useful tool is to be able, uh, is the ability to create an arbitrary line that goes through all of your wells. And then display that in both 2D and 3D. I've gone ahead and saved an arbitrary line already. If I double click on that, I can now apply and open a 2D um, a window that shows an arbitrary line through all of my wells. By clicking on the upper right hand corner and displaying this in 3D, I can set up the same type of view as we did before in 3D. And we can now see the well path and that arbitrary line going through all of those wells. Very simple to do and very simple to set up. Okay, the next thing we're going to move on to, we're going to switch gears a little bit and head over to uh, highlight um, what we can do with horizons and most specifically um, what we call our horizon stacks within the software. For this demonstration, I'll start much like we did before by opening up a seismic inline. And then I'll change my project browser to the horizon topic. And I'm going to open up a horizon stack that I mapped the seismic amplitude onto. I'll use a shift H command to tile these horizontally. Now you'll notice a bright yellow line that comes across my seismic inline. That is the intersection of this horizon slice. Now, if that's not bold enough, you can always change that by interacting with your properties pane. For instance, if I open up my intersection style and click on width, you'll see by ramping this up, I can make that uh, all the way, I can change that up to a width of 10 or as thin as a, as a width of one. I think for this purpose, three or four is probably fine. And you'll see by placing my cursor within the horizon stack window, just like I would advance the seismic inline by rolling my scroll wheel, I can do the same thing with my horizon stack. So if I roll my 
scroll wheel within my horizon stack window, you'll notice that the intersection of that horizon stack slice and the seismic is now advancing to a shallower depth. So I'm just rolling my scroll wheel up and down to advance that horizon intersection. Just like I did with my inlines, I can also grab the, the slider in my volume manager and quickly slide up and down. Finally, the last way that I can manipulate these views is with that cross, uh, cross navigation tool that, we've, that I've mentioned before. So by placing my cursor in the seismic window, holding down my mouse button or my primary mouse button or mouse button one, and dragging my cursor, you can see I can quickly jump to any horizon stack um, within that, that AOI. So I'm very quickly manipulating and moving around by just using my cross navigation tool. Now, because each horizon slice is going to have a different range of values, one thing that we've included in the software is the ability to auto contrast, and that's found in your properties pane. So I have to turn that on. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna force the software to recognize the max and min values for each horizon slice and update your color bar so that you've got a more consistent uh, display when you're moving in through your, your horizon stacks. We can adjust the color of the horizon stack just like we did with the seismic by running my scroll wheel in my uh, gradient window here. And if I play around too much, I can always click on the initiate to get back where I started. One very unique option uh, specific to PaleoScan because of the use of our horizon stack is the ability to dynamically flatten your seismic based on uh, the open horizon stack viewer window. So on the lower left-hand corner of your seismic window, you'll notice a few, a few small icons. The second one from the left is the horizon flattening. If I click on that once and select the viewer, the software recognizes all the open viewers that I have. In this case, I just have the one. I'm gonna select that and say, okay. And you'll see how the software very quickly flattens on the horizon that is um, being viewed in my horizon viewer now. Now, that in itself is very handy. However, the real value comes in the ability to place your cursor within your horizon stack window and then run that cursor up and down. And you can see how I can dynamically flatten the entire seismic volume based on the intersection of that horizon stack slice. So now, just like we showed, or just like I showed with the seismic volumes, we can also apply certain attributes, structural attributes, to the horizon stack. So by clicking once in the horizon stack and interacting with my properties pane, I'll come to my attributes and you'll notice um, I have a whole list of all of these structural attributes that I could quickly apply to that horizon stack. Now then another neat thing that we can do is utilize a volume blending viewer or horizon stack blending viewer to overlay a horizon stack with another horizon stack to see if we can recognize any trends uh, by blending the two stacks together. I'll just close these windows to show you that. And that option is here in the two channel blending viewer drop down menu in your main toolbar. I'll come down to the two channel horizon stack blending viewer. I'll drag my RMS amplitude and my seismic amplitude horizon stacks into my blending viewer. Using my transparency operator, you see I can either show 100% one channel. Uh, the, uh, the, the point of this is to then blend them together or I can show 100% the other channel, but typically we'll use a slider to blend these two objects together. If I like, I can apply um, a filter to any of these, and that'll be displayed in, in the blended window. And just like I did with some of the other windows, if I want, I can now display this in a 2D window. By selecting that object in the 2D window, I can access my transparency operator, even in my my 3D window, and you'll see that it is actually applying the filter, not the base attribute, uh, because that's where I left it when we uh, when we set it up.
So that's a really neat, intuitive way of blending horizon stacks to help highlight certain geologic features and then display those in a 3D view. All right, I'll close these windows and let's move on to the next topic. The next topic we'll be discussing is geobody and cultural data within the software. It is very easy to create and manipulate certain geobodies and multi-Z objects within the software. And it's also very simple to import and create cultural and polylines within the software. I'll show you a few ways of displaying and manipulating multi-Z or geobodies, as well as cultural objects. So in my project browser, I'll switch from volume to bodies. And I've made a few geobodies just for display. I'll right click and say open in 3D. So this should look familiar. We've still got the blended view in my, my 3D view, but now I've got this gas cap, this 3D geo body that I created previously. And geo bodies that have been created are actually static. So you cannot manipulate or change the shape of a geo body. But for this video, let's just talk about how we can change the appearance of this, of this geo body here. So I created this geo body based on that gas cap feature. And let's say I don't really like the color. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select it. I know it's the selected object because it's turned red. And to do that, I double clicked with the selection mouse mode. And then in the display properties, you'll see if I select the edge style, I can change its color. Let's make it a nice green. And then I'll unselect it so we can see that change. So to change the color of a geo body is really simple. Now there are a few things we can do with geo bodies. If I select this geo body again and click on the geo body volumetrics icon by applying a uh, very quick conversion factor because I'm working in time here, we can get a gross rock volume based on that geo body. We have all the standard industry units that you may want to apply. And again, this is just for a really quick gross rock volume estimate of a singular geobody. Now we also have a geobody classification tool, which allows you to just drag and drop any geobody, layer or multi-Z object. And it'll then very quickly calculate the volume, total surface and projected surface of that multi-Z geobody or layer. Again, it has all the industry standard um, units to, to display um, these, these geobody calculations in, as well as a conversion factor and as you see, they're all updated very quickly. If I wanted to, I could export this table in either a CSV or a text format. I can also create very quick isocore computations based on any of the uh, geobodies layers or multi-Z objects, the ability to snap to the top of that geobody. is typically what I use. And you'll see I can create a really nice quick isocore based on that geobody and display that in 3D. Now, one of the nice things that we can do with cultural data is to display those in 3D. I'll just drag and drop a few cultural objects. And now what I wanna do is actually a pretty neat Pretty neat thing here. When we display cultural data in 3D, uh, typically they are displayed at, at depth zero. But if I want, I can uh, force those cultural objects to lay directly onto the horizon. So what I'll do is I will select the cultural data that I've drag and dropped into the 3D. And then if I go to my properties pane, You'll see I have this option, Map to Horizon. By turning that on, you'll see it very quickly maps down to that horizon stack horizon that I have displayed. So if I can grab this other data, there you go, got it. And I'll click on yes, and boom, you'll see I've now mapped it directly to that, that data object. So by scrolling up and down, you'll see my cultural data. So block outlines, for instance, 
can be quickly mapped to the horizons that I've got displayed in 3D. Let's switch gears again. And let's finish off the video today by talking about how we display and manipulate faults uh, in the software. Okay. For this demo, I'm going to switch to my fault topic in my project browser. And I've got a number of fault sets that I've already created. So I'll go ahead and just drag and drop this fault set into my 3D window, and we'll see all of our faults displayed in 3D. I'm going to remove just this so we get a little bit of a better view. So here we see all of our faults in a few wells within my 3D window. What I want to do is show everyone how we can then um, kind of manipulate and filter out some of these faults uh, to get a, a, a kind of a more manageable fault set. So what I'll do is click on this dip azimuth tab here uh, that's next to my color bar. And you'll notice that it just it changes the display. And what I'm looking at now is the, um, the dip and azimuth um, of each of the faults within my 3D display. Below that is a size histogram, right? So on the left-hand side are my very small faults, and on the right-hand side are my very large faults. So the first thing I can do is grab this kind of coral-colored um, end member with my primary mouse button. If I start moving it across, you'll see I'll start to remove some of the smaller faults from my 3D display. A lot of times I do this to kind of get rid of some of the smaller fragments of faults that maybe are just noise or that maybe are kind of gumming up the, the, the display, and I want to be left with just my main controlling faults. So I'll, I'll kind of bring the, uh, the small filter, the small end filter down a bit, just to get rid of those, those smaller faults. Now, the other thing I can do is interact with my dip and azimuth filter um, to remove specific orientations of faults, or faults, I should say, of specific orientations. So I'll set up a dual azimuth uh, filter. So by grabbing on this yellow tab here, and opening this up, you'll see I'm creating a shaded zone, and this is the inclusive zone. So in my dip azimuth filter, where I'm showing are the, uh, the faults that are beneath this shaded gray area. And in fact, the green faults indicate the faults that are being displayed in my 3D seismic. The magenta colored faults are the faults being hidden by my size. And of course, the gray faults are the ones that are being uh, completely hidden. So if I wanted to, for instance, only display faults that are striking north-south uh, with a full dip range of 0 to 90 degrees um, uh, with a size, a minimum a pixel size of 63 to 74. Um, this is what that display would look like. Now, if I wanted to adjust or restrict the dip, I could grab on these orange tabs and restrict uh, based on dip, of course, from uh, 90 being in the middle um, and 0 being on the outside. And so if I wanted to restrict the, uh, the fault set even further, I can set up this, this fault filter to look like that. And now if I want, I can save that fault set. The software recognizes that I've filtered and that I've got some faults hidden. So if I wanted to save that as its own fault set, I would say save just only the visible faults. I could give it a new name. And voila you'll see that new fault set in your project browser under your 3D fault folder. So to finalize things today, I think I'll just go ahead and turn on some of the, some of the previous objects that we had turned on in the, uh, in the 3D view. I'll show everyone again how we can set up that seismic view really nicely. We can create a cube, how we change the color bar for that cube and for the, for the seismic inline if I want. Again, I'm just double clicking and selecting the sides of the cube to gain access to that inline. I'll change it maybe to a time slice or a cross line actually. 
And if I want, I can change that color scale too. So you can see PaleoScan is a very, very easily, uh, easy way to set up and display um, multiple uh, different types of all your geologic data to alter those data and apply a certain real-time and uh, on-the-fly attributes to all of those uh, data uh, to really help you uh, develop your story and develop your, your geologic model moving forward. So to recap, I'll just mention again that you know PaleoScan is both a 2D and a 3D visualization interpretation software uh, that allows uh, for the use of all different types of geologic data, seismic horizons, fault wells. The interactivity between the, uh, the 2D, 3D windows using the cross-navigation tool is, is one of the things that we're very, very proud of that we feel helps us to stand out um, uh, amongst many of the other uh, competitors showed you how to use and, and manipulate your real-time attributes and the color blending um, from, from both your 2D and 3D windows. And again, we've, uh, we're gonna continue these, these video series. Uh, again, this was just the overall preview. So come on back for, for more videos on uh, each of these individual topics that will go in depth uh, to show you how to, to create manipulate all of these different data types within the software and build your own projects within PaleoScan. So thanks again for, uh, for stopping by and checking out this video. If you have any questions, please, uh, please send an email to support at elise.fr. We'll try and get back to you as soon as possible. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next video.